Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I am a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to be able to worship with you today. As darkness gives way to light and winter sleep to fresh beginnings, we come today to be reminded of God's love for us. Like the green shoots of renewed life stirring beneath the soil, we welcome an awakening of God's word in our lives. In this time of reflection and repentance, we affirm our identity. We claim our security as children of God. Please join me in an opening prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for your reconciling work, patiently, lovingly restoring all creation. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Reconciler and Savior, on this journey to new birth. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, dancing, delighting in the beauty of the earth. This Lent, deepen us in prayer and new vocation to your task of reconciliation. Help us look forward to your Easter mystery. Our hearts are restless till they rest in you. Amen. Lent is a period of penitential preparation for Easter. It begins on Ash Wednesday, six and a half weeks before Easter, and provides a 40-day period for fasting, abstinence, and or reflection in imitation of Jesus Christ's fasting in the wilderness before he began his public ministry. So how do you see and understand Lent and temptations, the struggles in your life? Do you think of those things in terms of self-denial, just say no, don't do this, don't do that, and everything will be fine? But then life gets complicated. It isn't that simple or easy. Just say no and self-denial are no longer enough. I suspect we've all had times and experiences in our lives when just say no didn't apply. Just say no wasn't relevant because the issue wasn't a yes or no kind of situation. What then? What, <clears throat> pardon me, where do we turn? So I've begun to think about Lent in those places of struggle, what we are often called the temptations, not so much in terms of self-denial, but more in terms of self-awareness. Maybe those situations offer us important learnings about ourselves. We are going to look at two scripture lessons, Genesis 3 verses 1 through 7, Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit, and Matthew 4, 1 to 11, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, <clears throat> or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat, uh, eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. In Matthew we read, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. 
Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. I think we often hear these readings and we hold them in opposition to each other. On the one hand, Adam and Eve got it all wrong, and on the other hand, Jesus got it all right. On the one hand, Adam and Eve were bad, and on the other hand, Jesus was good. I'm not saying that view is wrong, it just seems a bit superficial. I'm not suggesting Jesus got it wrong or that Adam and Eve got it right. I simply believe that there is a deeper meaning. When I moved beyond the dualities of good or bad, right or wrong, what I discovered is that both stories are about self-awareness. Think about Adam and Eve. They eat the forbidden fruit. Their eyes are opened. So what does that mean about their eyes before they ate? They were closed. They were seeing with closed eyes, a partial seeing, a sort of blindness. There's something about eating the fruit that opened the eyes of Adam and Eve that gave them a new awareness, that awakened them and brought them to a new level of consciousness. They experienced something of themselves and the world in the same way as does God. They became aware of good and evil. They saw it all. Life and their world just got a whole lot more complicated and potentially more real and more beautiful. Think about the times in your life when that's happened for you. There's been a new awareness, a new awakening, a new consciousness, and you see the world and yourself in a brand new way. More often than not, that seems to follow some sort of stumbling and falling, a failure, a turning away from God, one another, or ourselves. With that new consciousness, we might see beauty and goodness, but we also see pain and disfigurement. We see the places of wholeness and integrity and the places of brokenness and disintegration. And I don't mean that we see that just in the world around us. We see it within ourselves. We see the truth and reality of our lives. We see and understand ourselves to be a mixture of both. We see our contradictions. We are neither wholly good nor wholly bad. We are both. That's why life gets complicated. That's why it's not enough to just say no. If we look beyond their failure to say no, we can see that the garden experience brought Adam and Eve to self-awareness. By the same token, if we look beyond Jesus saying no, we can see his wilderness experience as having brought him to a strengthened purpose in his role as the Messiah. Immediately before Jesus goes to the wilderness, he is baptized. While Jesus is standing in the baptismal waters, a voice from heaven speaks and says, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. He goes to the wilderness having been told that he is God's Son. He goes to the wilderness having heard that he is beloved of God. He goes to the wilderness knowing that his Father is pleased with him. And all of that is given before Jesus ever faces the first temptation. So maybe Jesus' time in the wilderness wasn't so much about proving or giving something to God as much as it was about Jesus truly experiencing that he really is God's Son, that he really is God's beloved, and that God really is pleased with him. Maybe there was something Jesus needed to learn about himself so that he could come out of the wilderness strengthened in knowing who he was, knowing to whom he belonged, and knowing his message for the world. What Jesus gained in the wilderness formed and shaped his public ministry of healing, teaching, and preaching. If the wilderness was a place of strengthening for Jesus, might it not also be for us? If the garden and their failure to say no was a place of self-awareness for Adam and Eve, might it not also be for us? So what if we take these next 40 days of Lent and we let go of the questions about good or bad, right or wrong, and whether we are enough and we seek self-awareness? Self-awareness that is deep and profound, that reveals our truest and most authentic self, that makes us face and examine ourselves, not to make judgments or inflict punishment, but to seek healing and new life. I'm talking about the self-awareness that turns our gaze to God. 
This self-awareness will take us much further than will self-denial. That doesn't mean self-denial is not important or that it does not have a positive and necessarily ro and necessary role in our lives and in Lent. I just want to give self-awareness a higher priority and put self-denial in service of self-awareness. Think of past Lents when you've given up something like chocolate, meat, or alcohol. For 40 days you denied yourself, and what did you do after Lent? Eat chocolate? Eat meat? Have a glass of wine? So what did those 40 days of self-denial do for you? How did it grow you and change the way you see and engage with the world? What did it do for your relationships? Did it make you more real, more loving, more authentic? It was a successful Lent, but was it a holy Lent? It certainly proved that you could self-deny something for 40 days, but did it really change or bring you to a new life? While that's not necessarily bad or wrong, I think there is more to Lent, more to you and me, and more to our lives. I think God wants more for us and offers more. What if this year we go through Lent with God asking us, what are you learning about yourself? And what do you need from me? That just might be the start of a holy Lent. It would be a Lent in which our eyes were open to the truth about ourselves, who we are and what we do. It would be a Lent in which, despite things done and left undone, we would rediscover that we are God's beloved children with whom he is pleased. Maybe it would be a Lent in which we could let go of judgments and scorekeeping. Maybe it would be a Lent that would lead us to a new life, a fuller life, a life in which we discover that we are God's glory. What are you learning about yourself? And what do you need from God? Let's be God's glory today, tomorrow, and the day after, now and forever. And now let us, God's people, pray. Creator, Lord, you have given us eyes to see ourselves as we truly are and the heart to accept your free gift of grace through Christ. Fill us now with the courage to step forward in faith, to repent of our sins, and to turn the life we have given to your guidance and to your service. O God of mercy, we now confess and begin again. Creator, Lord, impel the political leaders in our world, in our nation, and in our community to rally to your call and forsake the temptations and vanity of the power of power and to govern with integrity, equity, and truth. Creator, Lord, sustain the faith and dispel the despair of all who are chronically ill in body, mind, or spirit, and of all who attend to their needs. Creator, Lord, lift us from our grief into the hope of eternal life and joy, reunited with all who now live again in glory with you. Most holy God, you sent Jesus into a world of temptation and trials, not so different from our world of today. Accepting obedience to your law, he triumphed over it all to save us. Shield us from the lures of false prophets as we begin our own 40 days of reflection to keep our hearts true and trusting in your eternal grace. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our great high priest, and the Holy Spirit, our sanctifier, who reign with you as one God forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hey folks, my name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Nazarene Church here in Chetwin. We're glad you're with us today. We are in the season of Lent, the time of preparation for the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to talk about the transfiguration of Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. Help us to truly appreciate the high cost you paid. Help us to be one of those who, like the thief on the cross, repents and accepts your grace and mercy. Amen. Luke 9, 18-20 One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, 
Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. Once Jesus returned, determines that they do know who he really is, he tells them that he's going to be crucified soon and will be raised from the dead on the third day. He then challenges his disciples to take up their cross and follow him, even if they have to give up their own lives to do so. With all that in mind, let's go ahead and read Luke 9, 28, 36. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see. And they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice was finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone what they had seen. So Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. Jesus was a prayer warrior. If there was anyone who you would think didn't need to pray, it would be Jesus, the Son of God. But think back to all the messages you have ever heard about the Messiah. Many times Jesus would go off on his own to pray. He would pray privately with the twelve. We see him praying for the twelve. We see him praying for all who would believe. This time he took Peter, James, and John with him all the way to the top of the mountain. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. What an awesome experience. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. They're talking with Jesus about his exodus from this mortal life, his eventual exodus from this world back to his father. This is an amazing thing. When we think of the reasons for Jesus' death, we often think of the guilt of those who planned for and most likely prayed for Jesus to die. Maybe we think of the guilt of those who were false witnesses against Jesus. We almost always think of Judas and his betrayal. We always think about the soldiers who brutally beat Jesus and nailed him to the cross and our own sin that drove Jesus to the cross in the first place. And yes, we're all guilty. Jesus brought this all about because of it was his plan to set us free and to give us eternal life. But then we read Luke 9, 32. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. They had been very sleepy, but they wake up in time to see what's going on. The amazing thing is that they didn't ask, Hey, Jesus, who are these guys? They knew who these guys were. Luke 9, 33. As the men were leaving, Jesus said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. So Peter, in his, unusual, in, in his usual fashion, had to do something. He had to just speak. But the lumber and hammers and saws and the nails are all down there somewhere at the bottom of the mountain in some town. They would need to get all this stuff to the top, plan out the construction, and get them built. Then they need to provide food and drink for all their guests. Anyway, Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter, but God steps in, God the Father. Luke 9, 34. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Often in the Old Testament, we see the presence of the Lord coming down as a cloud over Mount Sinai, the presence of the Lord coming down over the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. The presence of the Lord filling the temple when it was dedicated. And here it is again in the New Testament. 
In Matthew 17, verse 5, this event is described like this. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. Peter, James, and John would have been very aware of these historical references from the Torah where the presence of the Lord manifest in a cloud. So no wonder they were afraid. But now the Lord God of Israel is adding three more words in regards to his son. Listen to him. Luke 9, 36. When the voice had spoken, they found them that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This seems to be one of the few times when Jesus told someone not to tell anyone what they had seen and they obeyed. However, we do see John and Peter making reference to this event later in their writings. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice from the mountain when we were with him on that sacred mountain. And John says in John 1, 14, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So where was Jesus heading after this glorious event? He was headed to his death in Jerusalem, where he would die for you and for me. Have you ever thought about the similarities and the differences between the transfiguration and the crucifixion? Believe it or not, there are some. At the transfiguration, Jesus went up onto a mountain to pray. At the crucifixion, Jesus is still praying. Luke twenty-two thirty-four. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And Luke 23, verse 46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Both the transfiguration and crucifixion took place on top of a hill or a mountain. At the transfiguration, Jesus was met by the giants of Jewish religion, Moses and Elijah, who spoke about his departure. And now the differences. At the crucifixion, the Jewish elders and the Pharisees mocked Jesus, saying, Matthew 27, verse 40, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross, if you are the Son of God. At the transfiguration, Jesus was with his disciples, Peter, James, and John. At the crucifixion, the only disciple to be found was John. All the rest had scattered. At the transfiguration, Jesus was seen in all his heavenly glory. At the crucifixion, Isaiah describes it in prophecy as in Isaiah 52, 14. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. At the transfiguration, God the Father said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. At the crucifixion in Mark 15, verse 39, we read, when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. And we have to ask ourselves, why should the glorious Son of God allow himself to be abused and insulted and crucified? The answer is found on the cross on Calvary, right next to Jesus. Mark 15, 27 to 30 and verse 32. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourselves. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. Both of the criminals are heaping insults on Jesus. But to what do we see later? Well, in verse 39 to 43, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at them. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today 
you will be with me in paradise. How did the heart of a hardened criminal sentenced to death move from heaping insults to Jesus to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Imagine hanging on a cross next to a man whose only crime is claiming to be the Son of God. This man most likely would have seen crucifixions before, and he knows that no one being crucified is thinking of anyone but himself. But instead, Jesus is praying for them to be forgiven because they don't know what they're doing. He is making arrangements for the care of his mother. Not only that, it seems as if the heaven them, heavens themselves are furious at his, what is happening because the sky has become so dark that it seems night, like night and not just for a short time, but for hours. Luke 23, verse 44 to 45 tells us, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. The criminal sees this man hanging on a cross, forgiving, caring, not retaliating, and an ungodly darkness has spread over the whole land. No wonder the criminal repented and turned to Christ. There is so much in this passage of the transfiguration of Jesus that a person could spend weeks soaking it all in. But here are three things that we need to take away from. Luke 9, 35, a voice came from the clouds saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. 1. Listen to him. Jesus has the words of life. 2. We have a glorious Savior. And three, in order to one day see the glorious Savior, we must be saved. Let's close in prayer. Oh Lord, help us to be better listeners for your voice. We sometimes have deaf ears, and we ask you open those ears so we can hear your guidance and direction. Thank you for always being ready to hear our prayers, and thank you for answering. Amen. visual presentation to allow people to see kind of what happens. Obviously it's no roof collapsing and windows smashing, but it gives you an idea as to, you know, if you have a rollover, the windows are gonna blow out and you're pretty much, if you're not wearing a seatbelt, you're probably, the likelihood of being ejected is great. So, which you, know, you can be crushed by the vehicle when, uh, you know, the vehicle keeps rolling if you're flung towards the motion of where the truck is going or where the vehicle is going. You could get crushed by that vehicle. You could get thrown the opposite way and be 30, 40 feet away from the vehicle and we not, might not find you for a while. Um, I Last year I had somebody that was ejected, not wearing a seatbelt, roll over, fell asleep. And he was found 40, 50 feet from his vehicle and he was out there for three, four hours by himself before he was uh, located and he's now a paraplegic and he's 19 years old. So these things do happen.